Welcome to Trinity Community Church. It's great to have all of you with us today as we continue our series called Love One Another. Now, before we get started, I wanted to take a minute to thank all of you that have continued to support Trinity through prayer, practical service, and finances through this difficult season. It's because of you and your faithfulness that we've continued to not only be a light in our dark world, but also help people in practical ways. In fact, so far, Trinity has helped to feed over 6,000 people free meals and groceries through the well. That's bananas, 6,000 people. By the way, in case you forgot, the well continues to be open for business, producing all of the great food that we love. Now, in this season, Trinity continues to support people, missions, and organizations in practical and financial ways. How can we do all this? Through you. It's through your generosity. In fact, there's no better way for us to show the depth and the reality of our faith than when we love others, serve others, and give joyfully of our resources through tithes and through offerings. So thank you for your continued support. Now for us, the ultimate expression of giving is when we love. So what does it mean to love truly uh, people around you? What does it mean to love your neighbor? Before we get started with everything, take a look at this.
Good morning, and thank you for joining us at Trinity Community Church. I'd like to welcome you, and I'd like to also thank Pastor TJ for giving me this opportunity to have this talk with you today. My name is Daniel Lumpkin. I'm a board member of Trinity Community Church, and more recently, I've been named as one of the elders of the church. So I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to meet with you today. Today, we're going to be talking about what does it look like to be a neighbor? We're going to look at the story of the Good Samaritan. We're going to look at four different points of this story that I've identified as the setting, the story, the sequel, and the significance of the story. I'm also going to be introducing a term that I'm going to call mental mountains. And we're going to be able to take a look at what that means and how mental mountains may interfere or create circumstances of perspective for us that may not always align with what scripture teaches. So before we get started, I just want to you know, let everyone know we're going to be reading through the whole passage of scripture from Mark and then Luke 10, 25 through 37. So if everyone could get their Bibles and stand with me while we read through the scriptures, that would be great. We're going to start with Mark 12 and 31, then we're going to move to Luke 10, 25 through 37. Mark 12, 31. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, 25 through 37. A teacher of the law came up and tried to trap Jesus. Teacher, he asked. What must I do to receive eternal life? Jesus answered him, What do the scriptures say? How do you interpret them? The man answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. You are right, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Luke 10, 29 through 37. But the teacher of the law wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, there was once a man who was going down to Jerusalem to Jericho when robbers attacked him, stripped him and beat him up, leaving him half dead. So it happened that a priest was going down that road. But when he saw the man, he walked on by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite also came there, went over, looked at the man, and then walked on by on the other side. But the Samaritan, who was traveling that road, came upon the man, and when he saw him, his heart was filled with pity. He went over to him, poured oil and wine on his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own animal and took him to an inn and where he took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him, he told the innkeeper, and when I come back this way, I will pay you whatever else you spend on him. And Jesus concluded, in your opinion, which of these three acted like a neighbor toward the man by the robbers, attacked by the robbers? The teacher of the law answered, the one who was kind to him. Jesus then replied, you go then and do likewise. Now, I want to just bring a point before we get started with the setting. I just want to say in the book of Luke, it portrays Jesus as the perfect man, as the perfect man. I want you to think about that. Jesus as the perfect man who came to seek and to save sinful man. And so as we Move into the setting of the story. Here we have Jesus either in the temple or as he was moving towards Jerusalem, because in Luke 10 51, the scripture tells us that he began to set his face towards Jerusalem. And so, with that thought in mind, we know that Jesus was moving from city to city. And so, within those cities, he would begin to teach on things about the kingdom of God. And so you would have a religious teacher, in this case it was a, a lawyer of the law. And so from my understanding and what I've been able to, to, uh, to search out, 
a lawyer of the law, it isn't a lawyer in court. It was one that was an expert of the Mosaic law. And here in verse 25 of Luke 10, we see a teacher of the law came up and tried to trap Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to receive eternal life? Now, Jesus was very familiar with the Pharisees and he was very tactful and, and it always amazes me how he kept his calm. And so he uses uh, what's called a Socratic method. He answers the religious teacher's question with a question. Jesus says, what do the scriptures say? How do you interpret them? So here we see uh, Jesus simply asking this religious teacher, what is your understanding of the scriptures? In this case, we're, we're, we're talking about the law. And so the man answered, it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Here the religious teacher is quoting from Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, which those two scriptures together make up the sum total of the law. However, Jesus commends the teacher. He says, you are right. Jesus replied, do this, and it's interesting that Jesus says do this and not these two things, kind of indicating that to do the two is one act, uh, and, and we'll kind of summarize what that means later. Jesus says do this and you will live. So in Jesus commending this religious teacher, he's kind of trying to establish something, not just with him, but I think with us too. Jesus' point of questioning here is to establish the truth, clarify the religious teacher's position, identify a flaw, or what I'm going to now introduce, a mental mountain in his thinking, which is based upon what he believes. So, what is a mental mountain? You probably won't find this definition in Webster's. However, a mental mountain is a misconception. It's a prejudice. It's a mistaken belief. It's a stronghold of the mind that blocks or inhibits one from seeing the reality of the truth. It's normally displayed in self-righteousness, self-justification, or indifference. And we'll clearly see uh, what those characteristics are as we move along with uh, the story. So in verse 29, still talking about the setting, we see that the religious leader wanted to justify himself, asking the question, well, who is my neighbor? And I find that very interesting, you know, because we often sometimes are in situations where, you know, that very same question is presented to us. I know we have people in proximity of us that we consider our neighbors and going and coming, you know, maybe to work or to the grocery store, we come in contact with people, but it's very interesting to ask ourselves the question, who, who do we really consider as a neighbor? Let's move on. So I wanted to identify in the Greek and the Hebrew what neighbor is and what their understanding what neighbor, of what neighbor was in that particular setting. In the Greek, neighbor simply means someone who is near. In the Hebrew, it means someone you have association with having to do with nationality, excluding Samaritans, Romans, and foreigners. And Jesus kind of knew that already. And so he was so smooth in how he dealt with these religious leaders. He never showed any type of aggression. He never really confronted them in a way that appeared for him to kind of make a point he kind of like asked them to question, to question their own answer. So as we move on, we'll see that uh, this mental mountain, in my opinion, is where a lot of us fall into the trap of assuming something that may not actually be reality. And so as we move on, I also want to say that in verse 25, what must I do to, to, to inherit eternal life. Well, here we see you cannot do anything to inherit, 
to inherit something, it's about receiving. Like, so when my father passed away, not that he had a whole lot, but what he did have, we inherited that. It didn't require anything from us. We didn't have to do anything. It was just about receiving it. And this needs to be rightly divided in scripture because a lot of times we'll read scripture and if you're not fully understanding old versus New Testament, and sometimes I like to look at it this way. In the Old Testament, you have Jesus concealed. And in the New Testament, you have Jesus revealed. And if you're not rightly divining, correctly analyzing the scriptures, then you won't be able to pull out the truth of what Jesus was presenting because he was really presenting the gospel of the kingdom throughout his whole time. And the Pharisees, they was missing it. They was missing it. So looking at both of these scriptures, would it be fair to imply that in order to receive an eternal life based on the religious leaders uh, statement, one would have to love God 24-7, 365, with all their heart, their, all their soul, with all their strength, and with all their mind. That would literally mean every day from your birth to your death, every minute of the day. Who does that? Amen? So I wanted to also take a look at the religious leader's perspective in how he was interpreting the scriptures and kind of bring some alignment to the truth that I think would help us to better understand what Jesus' perspective was. Romans 3.20 tells us, for one is put right, for no one is put right in God's sight by doing what the law requires. What the law does is to make us know we have sinned. Interesting. Galatians 2.16 tells us, Yet we know that a person is put right with God only through faith in Jesus Christ, never by doing what the law requires. We too have believed in Christ Jesus in order to, put, to be put right with God through our faith in Christ and not by doing what the law requires. For no one is put right with God by doing what the law requires. So just to be clear, I just want to make a clarifying statement. Daniel Lumpkin is not against the law. I am for the law for the same reason that God gave the law. And Galatians chapter 3 and 19 gives us some perspective around that. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added in order to show what wrongdoing is. And it was meant to last until the coming of Abraham's descendant to whom the promise was made. The law was handed down by angels with a man acting as a go-between. So we see clearly that the law was added. It was added and it was added to show us something, show us something about ourselves, our wrongdoing. And it was also only meant to last for a period of time. And that period of time was until Abraham's descendant showed up. And that descendant, ladies and gentlemen, was Jesus. So Romans 7 and 12 also gives us uh, some clarity as to what the law presented. So then the law itself is holy and the commandment is holy, right and good. So you see the law is perfect. The law is perfect, it's flawless. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is that we're not. It is the weakness of our flesh that inhibits us from fulfilling the law. And again, you would have to really be able to rightly div divide scripture and really correctly analyze the old from the new to understand that. So as we move into the story, we kind of showed you what the setting was, kind of explained a little bit what was going on with the religious leader in Jesus. So now Jesus's response to this religious leader is a story. And this story is about the Good Samaritan. So I want to just give you a little something about these Samaritans. The Samaritans were despised by the Jews. They were considered as half-breed dogs. They were 
intermarried with the Jews of the northern kingdom after the Assyrians had conquered them. And it was the uh, southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin, after the Babylonians conquered them and they returned, that they kept pure to who they were as Jews. And then they were taking a look at these uh, other Israelites that had intermarried with the Samaritans and it created such a hostility. It created such a hate. Uh, I can only imagine uh, some of the racial tension that was occurring in their day. Uh, just, just something to think about, okay? So we come to the story of the Good Samaritan. And so the path that we're going to, that this story takes place, is between Jerusalem and Jericho. Uh, it was 17 miles long. It was 3,300 feet, and it was 700, approximately 770 feet below sea level. Now, when I think about this particular area of terrain, uh, and I've taken a look at it on several different maps, it was known also as the Blood Pass. So it would have been known by people of that day that it wasn't necessarily a road you really wanted to waste time on. It wasn't a road that uh, you wanted to kind of like stop and hang out. You wanted to get through there, get to where you was going, and, and, and kind of get through that particular area. However, in the story we'll see what happens and, and we'll indicate some things specifically a, as we move through that. But I want you to think about, like, in the world, as we walk through, as we sojourn through the world, what challenges do you face? Like what things do you come upon that challenge you to conduct yourself in a way to show good character, good moral character? And, and, and I want you to think about that as we walk through this story. In this story, we're gonna identify uh, what may sometimes uh, depict uh, humanity of our time, we're going to take a look at the victim. We're going to take a look at the victimizers. We're going to take a look at the indifferent. And we're also going to take a look at the concerned person. Now let's take a look at the story of the Good Samaritan starting at verse 30. Jesus answered, there was once a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when robbers attacked him, stripped him, and beat him up, leaving him half dead. It so happened that a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the man, he walked on by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite came there, went over and looked at the man, and then walked on by on the other side. Now here we have the religious leaders of the day, the ones whom we would expect to demonstrate moral character, love, and, and everything that, that is supposed to look like, you know, caring for their neighbor. Because the priest literally represented God to the people. So I don't, I don't see that happening here. The priest and the Levite actually show indifference. Both could have stopped and helped. However, because of their strict observance to the law, they would not. They both prided themselves in legalism, following strict literal conformity to the law while missing an opportunity to demonstrate love toward a neighbor. Now, when I think about that, it's something to consider. Do we sometimes, in the busyness of our day, stay rigid to the plan, whatever it is, like, I'm on my way to do this, I can't stop right now, or I got this going on, I don't have time. Do we ever consider ourselves as being the priest and the Levite? Something to think about. Verse 33. But a Samaritan, the Samaritan was the concerned one, who was traveling that way, 
came upon the man, the victim. The man was the victim. And when he saw him, his heart was filled with pity and compassion. He went over to him, poured oil and wine on his wounds and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own animal and took him to an inn where he took care of him. Wow. The next day, the next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him, he told the innkeeper. And when I come back this way, I will pay you whatever you spend on him. Now, at first glance, it, I, I'm going to use a term that Pastor TJ often uses. This is extravagant love. It is over the top love. And it's a picture, of course, of love, but of sacrifice. This man's heart was filled with pity and compassion. But upon further reflection, we also see something more. We see that the Samaritan possessed something. He possessed oil and wine, both to help with the recovery of the injured man. But there are also symbols that speak to something a little bit more. Oil to soothe the pain represents the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to empower, strengthen us, while the wine that he used to disinfect the wound is a picture of divine grace or intimate love. The Samaritan's heart was filled with pity towards this man, this injured man, and was able, he was able to provide the care he needed while not passing him by through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And then that, 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 that grace just poured out that intimate, unconditional love. Now, when I look at this story, I, I, I ask myself, do we love like that? Do we love our neighbor like that? I mean, do you go out of your way? Because this guy was obviously on his way somewhere else. And he stopped and literally, and, and don't miss this, he gave his life. Like all of the things that he had were things that he acquired through his own occupation, through his own toil, and however he possessed them, they were his. But he gave them freely, freely, asking for nothing in return. Finally, and, and this is something that I, I just recently saw as I was meditating on this scripture. Finally, back in the day that this all happened, if you couldn't pay a debt, you would go to what was called debtor's prison or become a slave. Therefore, the Samaritan paid the price or ransom to redeem this injured man from a debt he was not able to pay. Think about that. Think about what Christ has done for us. He paid a debt, a sin debt because we are injured, we are injured. Christ paid a debt that we were not able to pay. So, as we conclude with the story, I wanna take you back to April 3rd, 1968. There was a man by the name of Martin Luther King that delivered an address or a speech to a crowd of striking sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee. And in his address, he spoke about the Good Samaritan. But it was what he said about these two Levites and the priests and what he said about the Samaritan that, that kind of stood out to me. And I want to share that with you. He said that, and so the first question that the priest and Levite asked, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? And I, I, I looked at that and I said, that, that's some self-centered stuff right there. That's definitely void of Christ's love. But then he goes on to say, but then the good Samaritan came and he reversed the question. If I do not stop, 
to help this man? What will happen to him? Christ-centered love. Christ-centered love. People of God, there is a difference in how we demonstrate and display love towards a neighbor. And, and, and we might not all agree who our neighbor is, but we may need to agree as believers how we demonstrate love towards the neighbor. If you name the name of Christ, amen. So let's move on to the sequel. And in the sequel, we kind of see the same thing happening that, that I just shared in the Martin Luther King uh, speech, that Jesus kind of changes the question towards the religious teacher. In verse 36, he says, and Jesus concluded, in your opinion, which one of these three acted like a neighbor toward the man attacked by robbers? Jesus totally changed the question. He flipped the script as he normally did, right? The teacher of the law answered, the one. Interesting, right? The one. Here's that mental mountain again. After everything that Jesus has went through to try to get this guy to understand, hey, dude, you're not accurately dividing and understanding the scripture. And he didn't literally tell him that. But here we have this guy, the one who was kind to him. Jesus replied, OK, you go then and do the same. The question here is isn't about who is a neighbor. As much as I know, you know, that's kind of like the way we live in, in our society. It is never enough. As I look through the passages of scripture, we see three times. We see the priest, we see the Levite, and we see the Samaritan. All three walking through the path looked and saw the injured man. It is not enough to see a need. It is also about acting in love, extravagant love, going the extra mile. So now we talk about the significance of the story. And the significance of the story is just amazing as we kind of put some things together and kind of highlight uh, you know, some of the specifics around uh, what the story really depicts, okay? First of all, I want to clearly uh, express the significance of these mental mountains and why it's important for us to know that we may be uh, exhibiting uh, maybe a not fully aligned with scripture as it relates to how we conduct ourselves as believers. And I'm specifically talking about us as the church. It is a mental mountain or stronghold of the mind, and hear this, to remain indifferent towards people of a different nationality, race, or culture after receiving the knowledge of the truth concerning what Christ has done for us. We love because he first love us. It doesn't matter who, it doesn't matter the nationality, it doesn't matter the race. We love simply because he first loved us. It is also a mental mountain or stronghold of the mind that keeps people, communities, cities, and nations in bondage while seeking to justify themselves, which hinders one from displaying acts of kindness, and love to those in need. And so one of the things that is going to combat this mental mountain, ladies and gentlemen, is prayer. We need to be able to, to be a united front in prayer for our nation, for each other, and also against spirits of darkness that are influencing uh, some of this that is happening in our nation and even in our own lives. We have to be able as a church to take a look at this issue and we have to be able to, to allow scripture through the power of the Holy Spirit to help us understand where we may fall in this particular circumstance. So, do you see your true self today? 
did what was expressed through Jesus' story and the religious leader, did it allow you to see something about you? Do we as one body, the church, and I'm still talking about significance, do we as one body, the church, and individually, equally sense a need for God's love? Do we all, and I'm talking about African Americans, Indians, white people, whatever your culture, nationality is, whatever your social status is, whatever your occupation is, do we all equally see a need to experience God's love? Because if we don't, if we don't see the need to experience the magnitude of God's love and grace that he has extended to us, we won't have much love or mercy in our hearts for those who need the same. We don't want to be compared to the world because Christ has called us to a particular standard because we are the church. So who was this Samaritan? The Samaritan was Jesus. Interesting though, who is the injured person? Most of us would think it is us. And as I continue to take a look at this, the injured person may be you if you choose not to receive the truth and stay in that place of indifference or a mental mountain, but Jesus himself is the injured person. He took our place, he took our judgment. If you take a look at Isaiah 53, it clearly says that he was despised and rejected by men. And as I look at that story, and I see this injured man laying there, and I see these religious leaders rejecting the King of glory, rejecting the Messiah, and as they did throughout Jesus' life, they rejected him and, and, and they killed him too, just by the way. So just, just begin to take a look at that. And so, because we don't always see and experience things in the same way, we have to begin to take a more closer look at, at what scripture says and what God is doing in our lives. So who are the indifferent? The indifferent were the religious people. And the indifferent folk could be you and me too. We really need to take a look at these particular characteristics uh, that have been pointed out today, and, and we really need to begin to ask ourselves the question, am I indifferent towards race, culture, uh, people groups, class? These are questions that we need as a church. We have to address these issues because uh, you and me, right, we choose to remain ignorant if we do not walk in the love that has clearly been shown to us and demonstrated through God's grace. When we love a neighbor, it's an act of mercy and it's an act of love, even if it means personal sacrifice. This Samaritan sacrificed everything he had and even his money, his time, his possessions, everything he had. Loving one's neighbor has no racial, ethnic or cultural barriers, being willing to interrupt your own life, utilizing your time, your talents, and your treasure when such needs arise. 1 John 4 and 10 says this, this is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. There it is right there. This is real love. Jesus Christ bearing our sins as the perfect man and the perfect sacrifice. By the way, Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. We love others to serve them because that's what Christ has done towards us. Demonstrating mercy, compassion, and loyalty to God's covenant. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, Again, the question isn't, who is my neighbor? The question, as Jesus turned to the religious leader, 
am I a neighbor that loves like Jesus loves? So that's the question for us today. That is the question for us today. So I just want to thank you for joining us today. And if this message has challenged you, if it has provoked in you an urgency or a need for prayer, you can hit the chat box or you can connect with us uh, through uh, the uh, email address and someone would be more than willing to sit with you, talk with you, pray with you. But I wanna pray just for everyone because I know this wasn't an easy message to hear, but it's one we need to begin to embrace as a church because this is the time we're living in today. So Father, I just thank you for this privilege and opportunity. And I pray God that as this message resonates and begins to, to, to really inundate the hearts of your people, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that you would shine the light on every dark area, on every area of their soul, heart, and mind that may not be in alignment with your love. And then show us, Lord, show us, God, where we have erred and then help us to realign ourselves with who you are towards us so that we can demonstrate that love towards others. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today at Trinity. We hope you enjoyed our time together. If you have been impacted by what's happening at Trinity, be sure to invite your friends and family and spread the word. If you have any prayer requests, be sure to connect with someone in our chat. You can also email us at care at trinitychurchde.com for any prayer needs or other concerns, or if you would like to learn more about becoming a follower of Christ. Remember, God has a plan for your life. You are not a mistake. You are a masterpiece. You are valued and loved by God. See you next week.